it is very nice to be back. As I walked in the front door, I said, I think it's down this hallway somewhere. And I walked by people playing cards, and I walked by people looking at books and studying. And I heard this din from down the hall, and I said, it's my only senior. Let me follow that in the voice. Sure enough, I brought me here. Funny story about having the back of your heads photographed. Years ago, it was about 1993, I would guess, I was at WCNY on Old Liverpool Road in a pledge drive. And at that point, when we had pledge drives, I would be the guy on TV that you'd be saying, get off my TV, and I'd be saying, so call right now at 451-9269, we'll make it here. And when the phone drill really rang off the hook, Talent, as we referred to ourselves loosely, would go over and sit in the phone bank and start taking phone calls, yeah. leaving just one person to talk on air. So I went in the phone bank and I was taking a phone call, which meant I was like this, and I was writing, and I was sitting in the phone bank, and I looked up at a monitor across the room, and they were taking a picture of me. And it was the first time I realized I was going bald. <laughs> when you look from the front, you still got hair, but men, I mean, how often do you see the back of your head? Not that often. So, uh, so check out the videotape that's being made, and maybe some of you will be surprised. <laughs> I made a new pleasure with myself to not to look into the mirror anymore. <laughs> You know, I could go a lot of directions with that, Lewis, you know, in terms of agreeing or not or a plug, but I won't. How many of you know, well, first of all, before we even get started, the success of what we're going to talk about here is really more incumbent on you than on me. I know what I know. I'll do my best to thrill you and inform you about public broadcasting and its significance. But I'm really counting on you to jump in with questions. So if you disagree with something I said, you hate a program that I mentioned, you love a program that I hate, if there's, if there's something about public broadcasting or WCLR or Classic FM that you want me to cover, make sure you put up your hand so that we can make sure that it gets fit in, okay? Hecklers are, are okay. My first question to you is, how old is Big Bird? <laughs> Not as easy as you would think. Think about that for a second. All good guesses. But in reality, Big Bird is six, because Big Bird is always. Oh. Oh. That's the magic of oh. But your answer, 30, 40, 50, exactly how long has this, I was going to say six foot bird, but I think he's more like seven or, or eight foot. How long has he been enchanting your children and your children's children? And when it comes right down to it, I would suggest to you, as I used to on air a lot during the 90s when we pitched membership locally, I would submit to you that having a child sit in front of the television, as you've seen them all do, grandchildren or children, and they watch a sports show, and what do they do? They want to get up, and one of them says, I'm Michael Jordan, and another one says, I'm so, or they're watching a car race, and you know, I'm Daryl Waltrip, or I'm this one, and they, and they lay claim to that identity, and they want to be that person or that thing. In today's world, you tell me, are we better off having our children want to emulate Barney who I know we all hate, and that's okay, but are we better off having our children want to emulate this big, gentle, purple dinosaur and his friends, or emulate Big Bird and Cookie Monster and Grover versus all the other stuff that your kids and your grandchildren could be exposed to? That enough, in my mind, is a reason for WCNY to exist and prosper in this community, children's programming, because it's important. Now, at the other end of that spectrum, I remember during the 90s, when we talked about membership on air, talking about how my kids, who were much younger at that time, you'd be scanning through the channels, and I'll tell you, and please don't throw anything, I'm not a big fan of Lawrence Welk. I don't regularly watch <laughs> Lawrence Welk. You may, and I applaud you if you do. But back in the 90s, I'd be flicking through the channels, and Lawrence Welk, God love him, he was already gone for 20 or 25 years at that point, but he was still on public broadcasting. But I was flipping through the channels, and my kids told me to stop because they were young at the time, and where else can you see a spectacle like Lawrence Welk? The costumes, and the music, and the dancing, and my kids like this. Now, they might not run out of the house and tell their friends that they like watching Lawrence Welk. <laughs> Frankly, they were years, years went by when they were still watching Barney, and they wouldn't tell their friends because it wasn't cool <laughs> to, to watch Barney. But this is all about the significance of, of television and the role that it plays in our lives. Um, Lou kind of stole my, my thunder as it relates to the number of TV stations that we are. Because we are actually five TV stations now. And most people don't know that. Now, some of you may pick us up with an antenna. We are a broadcast service, and that's very core to our mission because we're available to everyone. If you have a TV <laughs> and an antenna, 
you can pick up WCNY. And again, that's part of who we are. Not everybody else continues broadcasting. Some channels are now only delivered to your home via cable. You know them because you've got a zillion cable channels. But as a broadcaster, that brings up extra expense to us, but it also means we penetrate deeper into the market because anybody, even if they can't afford cable or doesn't want cable, can still get our broadcast signal. There are four broadcast signals that we send out 24-7, as Lewis was saying. <coughs> they are delightfully and very creatively known as 24.1, 24.2, 24.3, and 24.4 on your television dial, if you get us on broadcast. <laughs> Where we are on your cable dial, who the heck knows? Because there are cable companies and there are satellite companies, and if you live in Casanova, it's a different uh, set, uh, cable company, and in Auburn, it's separate yet. So where we appear on your television dial, I can't help you with. But we have four broadcast signals, and one that is cable only for Time Warner. So we have actually have five television stations in one now. I mentioned those as being known as 24.1. How many of you knew that? How many of you were aware of that? Good. Thank you. Question. Yes. Is there? Uh, can we call Peter? Um CMY and, and find out where it would be, uh, depending on where we live? You can, or you can race to the room at the end of this discussion <laughs> and grab a copy of Ronnie CMY magazine. Now, in, this, is the, this is the copy that will be in your mailbox today. Did you get it already? Um, what, you know, it's just, you talk about detail, hold it out. Some people call them, they can't live without this because they want this level of detail. Um, but in here, there is a where to watch chart that shows, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of confusing, but it shows, at least from a 10,000 foot level, where you can see all these different products that WCNY offers. Or you can call 4532 easy <laughs> number to remember, and I'll have cards up here, and again, the magazines have the phone number as well. And we have a guy on staff who can help, because when you deal with Fios and Time Warner, and this cable vision system and that one and then the different satellite systems and it really can be confusing where to find out. And many people, you know, you sit down, you set up your TV and by the time you get it plugged in and you go through that initial scan, it's like, phew, you are so relieved that you've at least got some TV that you sit back and start enjoying it. You may be missing out on other things that, are, that, that you may be pay, even paying for via cable, but because you haven't set up your TV quite correctly, you can't see. And what a shame that is. But, those other stations, 24.1 that I mentioned, we call that, and again, this is really creative, we call that PBS. Because that is where the PBS programming goes, the stuff that we buy from the public broadcasting service. PBS is not the public broadcasting system, it's the public broadcasting service, because at its root, it's all about service and, and special programs for special audiences. So 24.1, That'd be the broadcast signal, or somewhere on your television dial, you get our main channel, which is the PBS channel, WCNY. Then comes Create, which is lifestyle programming, and we have kids programming there during the evening. World, which many people go nuts for, because World is public affairs, news, and documentaries. Again, this is all 24 7. Um, plus, which is moving at movies and cookie, cookie show, cooking shows, and some PBS shows that are time shifted over to that special channel. And the cable only uh, offering is a how-to channel. That's an eight-hour block that repeats three hours a day. So those are the TV products that we offer. From a radio station, who can identify the name of our primary radio station? There's another one. Classic FM. Now, good point. WRBO is great. They have nothing to do with WCNY. It's a great station. The difference there is WRVO is talk radio. WCNY used to have some talk products on Classic FM. You would tune us into Classic FM. And by the way, I'm going to put my phone here, and you'll see me check it from time to time. I am not checking for emails. I broke my watch last week, so I just want to keep an eye on the time. Classic FM is primarily classical music programming, 24-7. That's our primary radio service. WRVO is almost, you might say, a competitor because they're also a public broadcasting radio station. Well, isn't AER somewhat of a competitor? AER is the same thing. It's also public radio, meaning nonprofit, licensed by the FCC as a nonprofit public radio station. But WAR, as you know, is all about jazz. I love WAR. WRVO is all about talk. Many people love WRVO. They have repeaters 
all over the place. You can, when they do their station ID, it's WRDO, WRDD, WRDX, mm -hmm. because they've got all these different radio stations combined under one umbrella. And then there's WCNY, which is classical music. We have a little bit of NPR product, national public radio product, because we have to use the news. But other than the hourly newscasts, we don't do all things considered anymore. We don't do morning edition. We don't have car talk. Because those are already in this market with WRVO, and, and it would just duplicate another service. So we said, why not give our audience the core that they want, which is, which is classical music. But what most people don't know is we actually have three radio stations. There's Classic FM that we've been broadcasting since 1971, 70, when WONO closed in this town. Some people remember those days. Um, so we have Classic FM. We have two others that we don't broadcast. They're available only on the internet. And if you go to our website, at the bottom of the page, you can actually stream these FM signals. You can stream Classic FM on your computer. You just push a button, and you'll hear Classic FM on your computer. Or you can stream what we call HD2, which would be high definition 2, which is an oldies radio station. Or HD3, which is a 24-7 jazz station, available only on your computer. So the last two are only on your computer. The first one, Classic FM, is what you can listen to in your car or whatever the case might be because it's broadcast. Um, how many of you listen to Classic FM? Many of you knew the name. Big classical music audience. <coughs> on Classic FM, you find Exploring Music with Bill McLaughlin every evening. Some people go nuts for that program. Do you like that program? Bill was in town for our grand opening back in October. What a delightful guy. <coughs> he really is. Um, you have symphony broadcasts every evening at 8. You can listen to the New York Phil, the San Francisco Symphony, Pittsburgh Symphony, and others. The Syracuse Symphony Orchestra has a presentation every Sunday at 4. That, of course, would be from the SSO archives. You can still hear Don Dalas' voice uh, associated with those broadcasts, and many people enjoy listening to the SSO. Anybody in the room like bluegrass? Good for you. Re interesting recent connection between the classical music world and the bluegrass music world that you might not expect. That Bill Moulton was just explaining to me the other day. The, no, I'm not a musician, but the, um, the types of instruments, the fact that you're dealing with stringed in instruments, and the way that many of the musical presentations are established, composed, and performed, there are great similarities between classical music and, and bluegrass. And of course, Bill Moulton is on with the Bluegrass Ramble every Sunday night. Some of our classical music lovers hate that fact that we have three hours devoted to bluegrass. Some of our bluegrass listeners would like us to become completely a bluegrass station. And that's the <laughs> argument that we always have going on, is how much we devote to the various uh, genres. But I will tell you, classical music wins hands down, because classical music is 95 or 97% of our broadcast day. We do have Leo Rahill on every uh, Sunday at 3 o'clock with a jazz program and classic Sinatra on uh, Sunday mornings at 11. Bill Baker's live at noon. Everybody loves Bill Baker. What a, he's a wonderful guy, I'll tell you. And he's on uh, with this live at noon program since 2003. But since we've moved to our new broadcast center that I'll be telling you about in a few moments, we hope to begin doing that as often as weekly, having performers come in and play in our studio live on air and actually broadcast those concerts on air. And we invite people to come in and watch them. So you can come in and, and enjoy the, the live performance, have lunch. We have a cafe on site now, so have lunch at the cafe. It's really a delightful little afternoon. You come in, you enjoy a beautiful piano concert. We just acquired a piano last week. It hasn't been delivered yet from the Settner School of Music, a seven-foot Steinway that they're bringing in, which will help us attract some, some really impressive musicians who will enjoy coming in, if for nothing else, just to play on this instrument. But beyond that, we'll broadcast them as, as part of the Live at Noon presentation. Um, there's the Capitol Press Room. Some of you may enjoy. The Capitol Press Room is produced as a one-hour radio program out of our Albany Bureau. A young lady by the name of, name of Susan Arbeter makes that happen every day. It is, you can, it's available for streaming here in Syracuse on your computer, but it's carried by, I think I looked, yeah, 23 stations around the state pick up the Capitol Press Room because it steps from the, the governor's office. He's on an average of once a week on this program that explores political issues out of Albany and, and we make possible through WCNY. I mentioned HD2, Oldies, and Jazz. Anybody ever hear of either of those other two stations? That's probably a surprise to most of you, right? The fact that we actually have three radio stations. Yeah. 
we do a pretty bad job of promoting some of that. Questions thus far? That? What's that? How do you do that? You come and speak in front of 40 people, they get the message. But how about these other folks that are even jazz aficionados? <coughs> yeah, that don't know that that exists. Right. Yeah. I mean, how do you, how do you take that message besides your bulletin and now send it out, basically selling the opportunity? Do you know where we it? used to talk about that stuff? Pledge. During TV mm -hmm. pledge. You would think that people would go click, 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 and go away. But instead, WGBH in Boston once did some research, and they had a Nielsen study done during a pledge drive. And interestingly, the ratings went up during pledge breaks, not down. Now, why would that be? You're sitting watching a program, you're enjoying it, and all of a sudden there's some jamoke like me on TV saying, you should be a member, call it now. Why would more people watch that than the program? You know why? Because I'm a train wreck. Because I'm an amateur. And amateur television is a fun thing to watch, because how badly is Burton going to crash and burn while he's speaking? So you're going along, whoa, let's stop here and see what this guy is doing. That's the nature of Pledge. It had kind of an amateurish kind of, we would shine it up as all we as well as we could and try to be as professional as we could. But in reality, we were not newscasters. We weren't delivering that kind of message. So ratings actually went up. Now, my point in telling you that is it was during those pledge drives, Lewis, that we would say, you may not know about the significance of television programming in the lives of youngsters. Let's talk about that for a second. And then hopefully when I'm done with that message and I'm looking right into the lens, so I'm looking right into your living room, I say, isn't that worthy of support? Shouldn't you pick up your phone now? And by the end of 12 minutes, which is how long those, break, those, those breaks were, little breaks, 12 minutes, we would have people calling. And we also might say during that, do you know we have three radio services? It's not just one. You might enjoy Classic FM every day. And we have members who tell us that listening to Classic FM is like breathing to them. Yes. That it's that important. That having a classical music source in this community that you know is going to be there, except Sunday nights when it's bluegrass or during a jazz moment. But for the most part, you can go there and you can get your fix of that. That's important. So good for you if you partake of that. And good for you if you support it. But what about these other two radio stations? These are services that would not be available in this community if it wasn't for me. So we would talk about those kind of things during Pledge. And when Pledge went away in 2007, because our current CEO, Bob Daniels, said, enough. We're not going to do that anymore. There have been no Pledge drives on our air since 2007. We haven't interrupted a program with a membership drive. And membership has done this. Now, most recently, I will tell you the good news is it's doing that <coughs> and it's coming back. But we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But that's where we've missed the boat. And when Bob hired me a year ago, I told him over lunch, right, when he was offering and I was accepting this exciting position, I said, I may or may not agree with your stance on pledge. But you've said this is the way it's going to be. And by George, this is the way the station's going to follow. The only PBS station in the country to have eliminated on-air television. And in doing so, we have 300 hours of television programming in this community that other communities don't have. That's important. It's just, have we done enough to trumpet that message? Absolutely not. So this is what I told them was we need to get back on our air to talking about who we are and the significance of WCNY in the community because the community needs to know, and frankly, from a membership perspective, and that's my job, we need to always be looking for new members. Would it behoove you to partner with libraries? A partner in what way? On the internet, I mean, Matt does a newsletter, mm -hmm. okay? The senior center does a newsletter. Mm -hmm. Isn't there a way to sneak in there? Perhaps there is. Perhaps there is, and, and perhaps we should have a conversation with our, our director of uh, educational services and community engagement about partnership there. I think that might be a good idea. Does that mean that you don't do the tele-walk anymore? Yeah, we cheat there. We cheat there. I said we don't interrupt programs. Mm -hmm. I didn't say we don't preempt them. So for the, for, the, for the majority of our broadcast year, we don't interrupt programs. Three times a year, we do set up these little messages that say support WCNY now and we'll send you a CD. We'll send you a check. See, I'm, I'm kind of like you. I'm, I'm kind of a relic at the station because I was there for 10 years and I was gone for 10 years and now I'm back. So I still say, 
become a member and we'll send you a VHS. I still say that in meetings sometimes, and they all have at me. What are you talking about sending a VHS? But that's what it always used to be. Now, of course, it's, it's DVDs. But we do still eliminate programming for periods of time to make way for Telloc and for the travel wash. Telloc this year is eight nights. Um, it, will, it was on Thursday, Friday, Saturday. It will be on this coming Thursday, Friday, Saturday. This is a plug. And it's on the Friday and Saturday after that. You can buy weed whackers, trips, a lot of food certificates, Dunkin' Donuts certificates. Not bad. And ultimately, the two auctions will make about a half million dollars. How important is that to you in terms of the percentage of the, your needs, your funding needs? Yes. Very important. Um, I didn't actually compute that one, so I'll do it quickly in my head. Five against six eight would be ten. It's about seven or eight percent of our overall, overall revenue. We're a six point eight million dollar organization, and the two auctions together raise about a half million dollars in support of WCLI. Our president would love to get rid of auctions, and you know that you've heard him say that. Uh, he would love to make auctions go away because he doesn't like preempting programming. But we can't do without that half million dollars is the bottom line. If membership grew, if we found other revenue sources, which we're constantly searching for, and I'll mention in a moment, that wouldn't be an issue. But for now, the auctions are an important part of our revenue stream. And frankly, you know what? This is the 45th Telloc. I mean, it's kind of a community event that the community kind of rallies around. So I would never sell it as that, because the fact is we're taking away the news hour and a lot of other important television to make way for Telloc. So to say it's a community event, it seems kind of lame to me. But it does have that, it does have that secondary arm, and it's just part of WCNY's connection to the community. Now, the good news is, because of all these extra channels we have, all of our programs move. They don't just get preempted. But the primary programs and the ones that you really want, you can find somewhere on your television dial, either time-shifted or just at the same time but another channel. I keep pressed to get to those two, three, four. I never figured that out. I just have it on the one. And do you get us via broadcast? You know, I mean, with an antenna or do you have cable? No, I have no cable. Okay, and how old is your TV? Four, five, five years old, six years old. It's so complicated. <coughs> you, I mean, you, it's, everybody's nodding. You know that if you went to her house or to her house or his house and tried to do something on their TV, you go, I, A, I'm afraid I'm going to change it, and they'll never be able to change it back. We all have that fear. And so I, I can't answer your question, but I can tell you, call the, the number, call us. And we'll get an engineer on the line. And I hear our people having the longest, sweetest conversations with people. <laughs> try, well, try this button. And do you have one of those buttons? And we'll do that. You won't get that from, from anybody else. But our people will get on the phone with you and, and try to help. Because we, we, we want to we wanna make it right. <coughs> A lot of people do. She's great. So we, so we talked about radio. Favorite programs. Your favorite program on WCNY. Bruce Carlson. Jesus. Big voice. Plus you third at six o'clock in the morning every day. Oh, ivory Tower. How many of you like Ivory Tower? Okay, I won't ask you how many of you are members. I'm not gonna ask that question. Look at that seat and they proudly put up there. Proudly. Good for you. We got a message this morning. Did you get what I'm sorry? We got a message this morning. About Ivory Tower? About Ivory Tower and the celebration that they're having. The only thing that I wanted to ask you was, yeah. you can the the reception or whatever right. it is afterwards, hundred dollars a couple. Right. What if you're single? I thought you were discriminating, quite frankly. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a good question. That's a great question. Sounds like it would be fifty, doesn't it? Yeah. Exactly. Well, as of this moment, for you guys, it's fifty. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's a great point, and we were. That's a discriminatory thing to have done, and, and I hadn't heard that yet, and I saw that email before it went out. What we're talking about is that the 500th episode of Ivory Tower is going to be taped in a few weeks, and we're having a live event outside at the new broadcast center. We hope to do it outside if it's a nice morning. For an hour, it'll be a 9 a.m. live taping, which is an old term. It's not a taping. There's no tape. It's a recording. Um, and members are invited. So for all of you, put up your hands. We're all invited. And if you want to give us a little extra money, and we'd love to have you do that, you can come inside afterwards and enjoy breakfast with the Ivorians. And they'll be speaking and telling some of their funny stories about program issues. And, and, and 
Uh, you might be interested to know that is our number one local program. Somewhere around 12, 13,000 people watch that every week. Yes, where is the new broadcast center? Do you know where Kitty Hoynes is? In Armory Square? You're not familiar with Kitty Hoynes? B BC Restaurant, the new Marriott. Those are all on Fayette. That's Fayette Street. You can't get there because of it. I tried last week for an hour to get to your station. It's all blocked to go downtown. Yeah. Go down yeah. it, it's, it's hard right now. And the West, the West Street ran from 81 <laughs> and screwy, so it'll get better. But if you walk out of Kitty Hoynes and take a left, and walk down Fayette Street. Eventually you walk past the SU, it, it was called the Warehouse, the School of Architecture is on your right. You're walking and you cross over West Street. This is me walking along, you keep walking along. And eventually you go under a bridge. You pass the Red House on your left, that arts, the art center, the Red House. Now you go under a bridge, and when you come out from under that bridge on your left is where Case Supply used to be. Huge white building. That's huge white building is not what you've seen a lot. It's past the Delaware Center. No, it's before the Delaware Center. So it is before the, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right next to their neighbors. Yes, ma'am. I recently took a tour. Oh, did you? It's beautiful. That's a nice place. I was so impressed with what you're doing for students. Uh, that, that the enterprise that America will The Enterprise America. We'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah. Beautiful. Pretty wild. Yes, ma'am. What about the parking? They people park in front of your building, or they have to do on street parking? We, we have, I'm not going to give you the number because I forget what it is. We have enough parking for our employees, certainly. And, and the ProLit is on the other side of our building, and they have parking in the same lot, and it's gated. We have visitor parking for six, about ten there. And what we do is whenever we have an event, all of our employees park somewhere else. So, I mean, if it's an evening event, it's not a problem because our employees are gone. For daytime events, employees park in a lot that's owned by the Near West Side Initiative next door, and then we raise the gate so that our guests can park in our primary parking lot. So, we make provisions for parking. We have shared with Delavan before, and for his, some of his weekend's events, we let him use our lot. So, th it's, not, um, it's not bad. We have the same amount of parking that we did at Old Liverpool Road, except it's better lit. Okay. Um, and that brings me to another issue, and well, we'll talk about the whole Near West Side Initiative in a minute or two. Other favorite programs, I'm so glad you keep on an ivory tower so I could give a commercial for this upcoming meeting. We want 100 people in that audience. We could use you. If you're a member, respond yes and come down. And if you want to come to the after thing with the Ivorian, so be it. But we'd love to have you for that too. Other programs you enjoy? Everybody likes that. Highly rated program. Selfridge and Midwife. It's interesting, those programs, um, and some people feel that way about Doc Martin. So we will go kind of nuts for Doc Martin. All extra purchases that we have to make. We give PBS about a million dollars a year called dues. We pay our dues to PBS, and for that, we get to be a PBS station. And for that, we get Big Bird, and we get the News Hour, and we get Antiques Roadshow, and we get Nova, and Nature, and Frontline. Programs that we're very, very proud of. Really, this is quality, well-produced, informative, engaging television. It's what television should be everywhere. But that doesn't fill our schedule. So we have another budget where we go out and buy things like Lawrence Welk mm -hmm. and Mr. Selfridge and Doc, uh, Doc Martin and some others. Doc they, Martin is, is Doc, the best. He's a gas. <laughs> But that's all extra money that costs us. So that's where we're actually making a decision in house. Like, I believe in Dale Wagner, who you actually might speak to if you were to call in and ask about how to pick us up. He sits and puts together a budget every year and says, we're going to buy this and we're going to buy this. And I'll be honest with you, sometimes it's tough. Sometimes it's tough to come up with the dollars, especially with the declining membership base. It's hard to come up with that money. And that's why membership is important. Because behind personnel, which I did some more math, behind personnel costs, which make up almost 60% of our operating budget, as you would expect. Behind that, the largest single expense is program acquisition, whether it be for the radio or for television or whatever the case might, might be. So program acquisition is where the money goes, and that's where you come in, and that's where you're supporting. Who do you buy News Hour for? News Hour comes to us as a result of being affiliated with PBS. Okay. Of course, we all remember it. Some of us in the room yeah. remember it as the Jim Lehrer. Or, yeah. or McNeil Air, or we yeah, we watch McNeil Air. And it's not that anymore, but it's still a fine program. And in fact, Hari Sri Vasian, 
who the weekend host was with us at our grand opening in October. What a gentleman he is. He's he came become a, an icon as such. Yeah, more and more. Uh, interesting too because we had, we specifically reached out to the local Indian community who wanted to be present for his visit and they were with us for our gala on the, the, uh, uh, for the grand opening. And he was very generous and offered to get involved in support of that community or the community at large for special meetings and stuff in the future. So we have a new friend in, in actually I think he's in Washington. Um, he goes back and forth with, with Hari. He's going to have his own program on his He will. Um, nobody mentioned financial fitness. Some people watch financial fitness. You yeah. just saw the last one hour financial fitness. It's oh. coming back in May as a half hour program. Oh. It will not have a call in component any longer. It's changing, it's evolving. It's been on the air for over 20 years, I think. Why it comes back? Uh, pressures to fit other programs in, including a new program that I want to mention called Cycle of Health. It's a health-related program about people in this community, four doctors specifically, who are all cyclists and are very involved in living a healthy lifestyle and teaching others how to do that. So that's a new, a new program that we're just putting forth. Plus, it was viewed by the TV people that, um, that financial fitness had just, it, it, it's run with that format as a one-hour call-in program. It had run its complete cycle. Time to, to evolve. So <coughs> But the nature of it has changed as well. It used to be far more appealing a few years ago. How so? Well, I can't specifically say whether it's the personalities. Which has something to do with it. I just don't know. Yeah. I just I, I used to watch it religiously, and now I just totally lost interest. Mm -hmm. Isn't it funny yeah. how you know a program that really gets you? You may not be able to say why, but you understand that this program attracts me, and I want to come back and watch it over and over. There's something about it. That's where that extra layer of quality is. The same way that on a Friday out. night, uh, the whole lineup of news used to be a must right up until 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. But somehow that's weekended as well. What specifically? You don't Insight. like McLaughlin anymore? Insight can be a, a dead mouse at times, yes. for one thing. Yes. It interrupts the whole flow of things. Yeah, but we you still have a very solid lineup every Friday. Yeah, and I don't think there's a local program in that. Insight is a locally produced program that has a relatively small audience. We're still committed. We're still committed to it, and think that it's important to have that in-depth look in prime time on a weekly basis at some topic. But yeah, you're right. What did you refer to? You didn't call it a dud. You called it a dead mouse. Did you call it a dead mouse? Yes, I called it a dead mouse. That's an interesting because the subject was so. Appealing to only a select right. few. Right, not of interest to you. Yeah, I get it. And well, then, what would happen if you, if you bought in to the local programming concept with follow that insight after Dave Rubens? So it has a local meaning. And as long as you're here, and I love David, that bigger. But I looked at one point that every tower should be more locally focused than nationally focused. The subject, because you can get all that subject, all that national subject purview from McLaughlin. You, know, you don't get a local spin, but you're right. right. I've, I've heard that argument before. I've never heard him respond to it. Why don't you come on the 16th and ask him that question? Oh, I was right on by He and I have a constant. Can you comment on the demographics of your listeners or viewers? You know, who watches what? Uh, when? When? We have a campaign that never worked, that was on air before I came, that was called Evolution. And it looks like, the, the, the graphic support for this campaign, it looks like one of those things that you learned when you were in high school, and it would show, I don't know, like the whole chain of evolution of being a small little creature, a monkey or whatever, and then you evolve into this, and then as you age, you tend to get smaller, and, and there's this. And I find the whole thing a little offensive, actually. But, but the notion was that you become a member or engage as a young person for children's programming, and that PBS and WCNY would be with you for a lifetime, because there are program offerings and interests that stick with you for a lifetime. And so, to your question, we first attract people, like my priest told me once, how people 
you know, they get married and they, they come to church and then they have kids and they're really close to the church and then their kids age and all of a sudden, for some families, they back away from the church a bit and as they get older, they come back to the church. And it was just a fascinating discussion to hear him say. It, 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 I guess is a little bit like PBS, because people sign on as young families, they can't become big members. They're not sending 100 or 500 or 1,000 dollars a year, but they may send 20 or 30 dollars because they see the significance to their children. So they become members as, as young families. And then you get busy. You know, now you're 25, 30, 40, 50, whatever the case might be. We tend to reattract people as they age because they understand the difference. They get tired of Swamp King or <laughs> Pawn Stars, which I love. I love watching Pawn Stars. But do you realize how much time that occupies on what came out as the History Channel originally? It was going to be all about history, and now it's Pawn Stars and Swamp Kings. And, and fish underwater that they pull out of holes. I, I don't understand the whole thing, but so you know, television continues to evolve and devolve. And as people get older, they tend to become a bit more discriminating. They also tend to have more dollars that they can invest in things that they believe in. So I'm very interested in that the younger audience has reason to engage, but maybe not the capacity. My belief is what's going to save public broadcasting and keep it strong in this community is actually you. You want, and, and those who are 10 years or 20 years younger than you, or 30, but will come to the same conclusions that you have in life, that there are some important things that make a difference in your life every day, and that somebody needs to support them, and therefore you do. And, and, and I, I remain bright on that point, and that, that we can make that happen. Did that answer your, your question? Other questions? Um, our broadcast area surprises many. We broadcast to all or part of 19 counties. 1.8 million people have the ability to receive our signal. So we broadcast from Geneva, down into the Finger Lakes and Ithaca. We have a lot of members in Ithaca and of course Portland, all the way north to Oswego. And we have a radio transmitter in Watertown. We're not the public television station in Watertown, but we are a public radio station, classical music in Watertown. That's a little funky, because people become a member of the station under it's called WPBS. That's actually their call letter, it's WPBS. So if you live in Watertown and you want to support public te television, you write a check to WPBS. If you listen to classical music, you send a check to WCNY in Syracuse. And our classical, our, our transmitter in Watertown bleeds into Southern Ontario. So years ago when the uh, CBC, Canadian Broadcasting, pulled back in terms of its classical music offering, we've got six or eight hundred members now from Ontario, Canada, who send WCNY and Syracuse a check every year because the, the, the classical music that they get in southern Ontario is so important to them. And they're what a wonderful group of people, yes. Not only did that one, they answered the phone, they are so thankful that yes. we're here because they can't get it on their own station. They are. So they're like, very appreciative. And Financially so we have this huge area that we broadcast to, and then to the east, we broadcast all the way to Little Falls. So we're either broadcasting or on cable. If you're in Little Falls and you want to watch PBS, you watch WCNY. It's a huge broadcast area. And we haven't done enough. Unfortunately, people think of us as Syracuse. So if you live in Utica, WCNY is that station in Syracuse that we get. And, and we have to change that because we offer every single service in the living rooms and the barber shops and the hotels and the doctor's offices and the schools. We offer all the same services in Utica and in Little Falls that we do in Syracuse and Liverpool. Because that's the magic of technology, but we haven't we really haven't done a good job of, of selling that and we need to do a better job. From a governance perspective, WCNY will celebrate its 50th birthday next year. We're beginning plans for that now. Um, we have a board of directors of community leaders who are elected to lead us as a nonprofit 501c3 organization. We presently have a board of 12. Uh, those individuals are local financial experts and um, academics, and we have a physician and a former retired leader from BOCES locally uh, who brings us a lot of educational experience and a number of others. And they meet on a monthly basis at the station. They do not make programming decisions. That's not their job. Yeah. But they do ensure that the organization remains solvent, has a vision, and moves forward appropriately. 
The funding question, where does, where does the money that drives your public broadcaster come from? 26% of our income comes from membership. It's the single largest form of support, membership support. 26% of the revenues that drive public broadcasting here in Central New York come from members. We have a ton of $52 basic members. So for a buck a week, you can be a member of WCNY. Now when you collect 13 or 14,000 of those relationships, it starts to add up, as you might expect. And that's how many members we have today, 13 or 14,000. What do you have at the peak? A little over 20. For your dollar third. Mm -hmm. um, we'll talk about that in a second. That we do have a senior membership, 35 bucks. At what level do you qualify for a senior membership? If you think you're a senior. <laughs> <laughs> I'm responsible for all fundraising in the station, and I still can't figure out exactly what number we've got in place. So somebody says, I want a senior membership, and you say, okay, I'm a senior member. I would encourage you to think hard about that, though, because what we did is, over the years, we got to this funky place where we said, here's our membership level. A $35 senior and a $52 basic and a $72 family and a $100 full membership. There's a creative word, right? A full <laughs> membership. And then a $250 premium and $500 studio club and a $1,000. I'll tell you about our new $10,000 member in just a moment. I'm going to tell you about that member. There's no name for that. For that level. But we started with 35 and they said, well, we're nuts. It's as if we really want to encourage people to become. So now it's a $52 membership and there's an asterisk. And down here it says senior level membership. Because I'd like you to think about that before you jump in and say, wow, I can get away with this for 35 bucks. If I, think about it because every dollar makes a difference. So if you're a senior member, God love you. And frankly, if you can't even become a member, you want to send in five bucks. I get the nicest calls from people. 93-year-old woman calls in and says, you know, I can't do much. But I, I want to send in my five bucks. God bless her. You know, can you imagine somebody who, who stands up and says, that's all I can do. But, I'm, man, I'm going to do it proudly because I feel like it's the right thing to do. Well, we receive that money proudly. It's very important to us. But let's face it. There are a lot of people in this community who come up with a buck a week. It's 50, $52 a year or more in support of something that you use so frequently. So I encourage people to look at it that way. Corporate support, 18% of our revenue. Um, we call it underwriting. All right, now somebody's going to say, you mean the commercials, right? You mean the commercials between the programs? No, that's not what I mean. Those are not commercials. Those are underwriting credits. <laughs> well, they are, and I'll explain the difference to you. What did you call them? Underwriting credits. We, by law, have to identify any company that gives us money in support of our program. We have to, by law. And we have to do that so that you know that if we have a program about HMOs and it's funded by these four insurance companies, you have a right to know who's making programming possible. That's why the law was put in place. Yours is part of the Public Broadcasting Act of 1967. So we have to inform you when corporations provide money. Now we've gotten a little creative and come up with ways to do that, to do a little more than just say XYZ company help fund this program. And that has evolved to become an underwriting credit. Now, an underwriting credit contains no qualitative language. It contains no call to action. That's why it feels a little different. And for those people who say, oh, it's just a commercial. Well, there's only so many ways you can shoot a video, and there's only so many ways that you can read a script. But you'll find that we never talk about price. We never say it's free. We never say something's on sale. We never talk about price at all. It's a huge differentiation from a commercial. And we never say, think it, buy it, try it, taste it, go there. <laughs> we never say any of those things. That's a call to action. So we say, more information is available at TomBurton.com. Or more information is available at 4532424. Therefore, we're abiding by the law, as is every other public television in the state, but there, there is no call to action because all we're doing is giving you information. So it feels a little different. Now, are there a lot of them? Yes. Are we becoming even more aggressive and looking for corporate support? Yes. Will that continue maybe to cause you to say, geez, I wish those weren't there? Probably, but they never occur during a program and they signal local companies who want to support public broadcasting. <coughs> so, all right. Throw your tomatoes now. What's the story? <laughs> but when it's Boeing and 
before the program is <coughs> Boeing protecting America, making America safe for you. That's not a sales pitch? The PBS Red Book, as it's known, which defines what we can and cannot say, is full of gray areas where judgment calls are made on a national or local basis. And it has been determined by PBS and through their conversations with the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, which is the funding arm for the money that flows to PBS stations, that um, a slogan that is part of a long-term marketing strategy of an organization can be part of an underwriting credit. So there are, that's one of the areas that's pretty gray, and, and you've brought up, you know, you caught me. Because everything that I said is true, but if Boeing is using that sentence as part of their basic foundational marketing, it's allowed to be repeated on the air PBS. So I don't know what the specific statement is that you're referring to, but I can tell you another thing is that decision wasn't made locally. That underwriting credit came attached to that program. So when we get it off the satellite, it's already because that they were a national program sponsor, most likely. They're not, they didn't get, I can tell you, Boeing has written no checks to WCNY. They may have written a check to WGBH in Boston for the production of NOVA, for example, because it's a science program. And then <coughs> WGBH would attach that underwriting credit. And when it goes to all the stations, that's already on there. Um, but it's a, it's, that's a great one. You'll find that many of them do not. There are some that do carry that kind of slogan. Thank you, sir. How do you feel about accepting money from David Koch? <laughs> I have no opinion on that matter. Big issue in Boston right now. Yeah. Big issue with WGBH, where he sits on the board. Um, I've just read something in some press about that within the last week or two. Um, yeah, it's, it's an issue. It's an issue, and, and it's something we should all watch. And get that way. But that's what public broadcasting is about: is that discourse and who's right and who's wrong, and keeping it open and keeping it alive and so it's a reasonable, it's a reasonable issue, but I, I, my personal feelings are really Could you discuss it a little bit since we haven't heard about it? Uh, he's one of the Koch brothers, right? Who uh, uh, sponsor all kinds of uh, <coughs> rights. Go far to the right. Far, far, far to the right. Vicious. Oof. We're going to learn more over coming years, I think, about not just them as an entity, but about campaign finances and the money that is <coughs> relation to politics. You know, you, know it, you hear more and more about that, and that's that's kind of what this is. It's. Mm -hmm. uh, How did the brothers ever get on the board? They're not. I believe oh, one of them is. Oh, one, yeah, they don't I travel in a pair wherever they go. I have no idea. They may live in Boston. Oh, oh here, this one may live in. I, that was my understanding too. I, I, I can't speak to how WGBH in Boston elects oh. their board members. I, don't know. I mean, they're a, they're a Massachusetts registered 501c3 organization that PBS doesn't control, just like the, they don't control WCNY either. We're a company in our own right with our own board members. Explain the difference between PBS, mm -hmm. NPR, mm -hmm. and CRB. CPB. Yeah. Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Yeah. Um, PBS, PBS is a producing entity. PBS, um, the Public Broadcasting Service, is headquartered in, um, in Washington and some 200 or 250 stations around the state, around the country, pay dues to PBS for the rights to broadcast <coughs> PBS produced programs. Um, PBS produces those programs in part through relationships they have with some large producing stations like WNET in New York, WGBH in Boston, WTTW in Chicago, um, the LA station in San Francisco. These are the major producing stations. Um, NPR is the same thing on the radio side. And National Public Radio is an organization, again, in Washington that has affiliate stations, hundreds and hundreds of them around the country, who pay NPR for the right to carry the NPR logo and broadcast some NPR product. There it's more of an a la carte relationship where when WCNY used to broadcast All Things Considered, we would have to pay NPR for the rights to broadcast All Things Considered. And you did it kind of program by program. 
Now we don't have that much programming from NPR. We have some of the newscasts, exploring music is, a, is an NPR product that we buy locally and make available to you. Um, so there are member stations of NPR. CPB, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, is an organization that was established in 1967 as a result of uh, the uh, Public Broadcasting Act of 1967. CPB is the funding arm through which money flows to individual stations. So the third largest chunk of money that WCNY receives every year is from New York State Education Department in support of our educational initiatives that I haven't even begun to speak to you about. And the fourth largest chunk is from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, the CPB as it's known, who pays a grant of about $900,000 a year to WCNY for us to continue our, our operations locally. They also fund individual programs, so at the end of a program you'll see that it was made possible by the American people through the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. That's somebody in Washington who decided to invest in a specific program. 58% of the budget then is paid on our tax dollars. Mm. What would make you say that? 58%, that sounds well, you high. You said 26 came from the 26 are underwriting or, and uh, the other. Underwriting, no, underwriting is corporate support. The other 58 is coming from grants and, and, uh, and uh, government. Uh, what I actually said was 15% is Department of Ed and 13% is CPB, so that's 28%. 28% of our income. And you said New York State is funding coming. That's the New York State Department of Ed. That was 15%. Which is tax dollars. That's correct. Yeah. Yes. And CPB was how much? 13%. Um, are you willing at this moment to delve in to what is happening with these two subject matters? Aerial. The what? The aerial matter. Barry Dillard funded a little small antenna plugging into your and bypassing uh, the, uh, yeah. the major network. The major uh, cable people and bypassing the Time Warner for Comcast and uh, that ruckus brouhaha. It's not on my plate. Got it. Understood. And I, I can understand it not, but it's a broadcasting issue, which someday I could see, sooner or later, mitering in to the public broadcasting <coughs> industry. And there's so much change on the horizon. Yeah. It's hard to keep up year by year with, yeah. with what's happening in terms of technology and broadcasting. Are you willing to, I'll go through another. Sure. <laughs> There is this concern that you can, by having to get your signal on the cable that you're really buying the dinner in deference to the a la carte menu, you like to watch the History Channel because it's really But there are other channels you aren't watching, but you're paying for. Yeah, I'm paying us. Ahead. But sooner or later, that could be a concern. How it will miter in to the a la carte bundling <coughs> picture, I haven't quite, and nobody has, but it's <coughs> going to happen because you're going to want to pay to get WCFY TV. But you don't have to pay because we continue to broadcast. Right, over the, over the air. Over the air. All, all four main channels. There's the one cable product that you wouldn't be able to get. But. Then my point is Bill. But sooner or later, the other three guys in town are going to become cable channels if this aerial big cloud. I hear you. I, I've probably read less about that than you have. I really just don't know much about it because okay. there, there's just so much changing. I, I, one of the things that I love is the PBS app so that I can get the shows on my iPad. Mm -hmm. Do you have to pay extra for the ability for people to do that? Do we have to pay? No. Do you have to pay? No. Right? You just grab the app and go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
The good news is PBS and its overnight offering and then the offering of that service, which bypasses WCNY locally, because you can watch some PBS programming now on media that are other than WCNY because of all the crossover that's happening and other channels or other, other services and websites. They do run membership support spots in that programming and local people do respond and that funding does come to us. <coughs> that do. icon, that icon that you just spoke about, yeah. that you're putting on your device. Yeah. You just went to the Play Store and what did you get? What did you look for when you were? Well, I go to the, the, the App Store. Okay, the Play, Play Store, okay. Mm. Does everybody understand what's going on here? She's mm -hmm. talking about iCloud. Oh, I understand. Yeah. 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 No, 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 I'm talking about just smartphone, the devices. Well, okay. any, any of the devices. I mean, whether you you have a Droid or a Kindle or an iPad, it's all devices, and they all get. Does everybody a little aware of what's going on here? This kind of part of the conversation. You are, I'm sure. Sure. <laughs> it's just all part of the proliferation. Right. And I don't mean it's not fair to them, but as long as the subject's out. I understand, but I, 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 I wanted other people to understand that you can now get public broadcasting. On your device. Let me let me let me put it to you this way. Nobody should feel stupid. Oh yeah. My wife yesterday said she just finished reading Call the Midway. What? Call the Midway. She read it. I don't even know it's a book. I know it's a very popular program on our air. She said, I want to watch it. And and I've never watched I watched ten minutes maybe of Call the Midway. There's a lot to watch, about on five channels, and then you got a job, can't sit at your desk and watch TV. So, I went online, <coughs> called the midwife, you watch called the midwife? And we started investigating the various ways that she is a television viewer, who doesn't work during the day, so she's home. Where can she watch it and how? And there's PBS streaming video, and she has a Kindle, and she, so, so this is new to everybody, you know, they're, they're, so, the, the, the key is we're all being exposed to these programs and these products in ways that now change monthly, it seems like. And you've come across one of them, which is an app that lets you watch programs either on your phone or on your Kindle or your Nook or whatever that case might be. So, so my question was related. Will you ever be available on demand, like on the Time yes. Warner? Yeah, that was another one I was going to ask. I don't know the answer to that. I know that you can watch... You can watch Ivory Tower on there. You can watch our locally produced programs. Go to our website. They're available at no charge. You don't even have to be a member. You can watch financial fitness episodes from the past. You can see them listed um, in terms of what the program matter was. So if it was something about retirement that you were interested in, you can find a program on retirement and watch it. Uh, Ivory Towers are all archived out there as well. But when I missed that Martin last week, that was it. I, you know, those shows won't be coming. Um, I would encourage you to call WCNY, ask for the director of programming. He'll tell you when you can find from an episode by episode basis when you'll see it again. He'll tell you, well, I'm going to substitute something for that until the next until the next series becomes available. And assuming we buy the next series, it will begin in February. And I tell you what I think we're going to do is in December, we're going to start double pumping, which would be two episodes in a row of the previous series to get people warmed up for the new. And, and you'll have the whole story as to how those decisions are made and when you'll be able to watch that. But will you, in the short term, be able to go to WCNY's website and find that program? No, because we don't have the right to offer it to you that way. Do you have a WCNY app? Not a PBS app, but a WCNY specific. <coughs> we do not. Okay. Any plan, any talk, any conversation? Yeah, we're planning some pretty bold moves in terms of the use of the web uh, moving forward. We have not been aggressive in our use of the web up to this point, and we just had a personnel change that will allow us to probably move in that direction more aggressively. Yes, ma'am. I love Shields and Brooks. Is that something you have to pay a lot extra that it's on on Fridays? Like no. That? That's part of our relationship with PBS that makes that available. So there's nothing extra in that. It's a segment of the Friday night news hour. Yeah, it's part of our public affairs lineup as part of the news hour. How many in the room have heard of Readout? A few of you. Um, readout is our radio reading service for the blind. We own 2,000 special radios 
that we loan out to people who need them. And as a sub-carrier to our FM signal, meaning at no extra cost, by the way, we talked about, uh, from a cost standpoint, personnel being some 60% of our budget. Uh, the second piece being program acquisition. The third largest expense we have is utilities, as you might expect. It costs a lot to broadcast. It costs a lot less now digitally than it used to in the analog world, but it's still fairly expensive. Now, read our program. Every minute of every day when we're broadcasting our FM signal, as part of that signal, as a sub-carrier to that signal, is the readout signal. Readout is a radio reading service for the blind where we have volunteers come in and read today's paper, for example. They read it early in the morning, cover to cover, obits, how much a pound of bacon costs, the whole shoot match. It is recorded. It's played back a couple other times during the day, in addition to the Observer Dispatch in Utica, I believe the Watertown paper, some magazines, some poetry. We also have a purchase block that comes in uh, for the overnight so that, so that it's on 24-7 and we issue a program guide to those users so you can look and see or read it in Braille exactly when programs are going to be on and then we give you a radio that is specifically tuned either to our Utica transmitter for FM or our Syracuse transmitter or our Watertown <coughs> transmitter and you can turn this, tune this on and if you can't see or if you can't hold a newspaper or a book, someone will read to you. This service will be expanded shortly. It looks like we're going to uh, mount a web-based version of readout as well. So it will be web-based and radio-based. But it's an important part of who WCNY is that, frankly, just most people don't know about. There are presently about 2,000 of the radios out throughout our, uh, our listening And they're area. looking for volunteers to come in to read the read Always the looking for volunteers. Descriptive video service. I'd be surprised if anybody in the room knew what descriptive video yeah, service was. Yeah. Very good. And I recognize you. Yes, I was there. <laughs> um, descriptive video service is the coolest thing. If you watch Mystery, or some of the children's programs, or actually a lot of the programs on PBS now, if I'm speaking, you can of course hear what's happening. So if you don't have sight, you can at least follow the storyline. But then if I'm quiet, As a sightless person, you didn't see that happen. When you turn on descriptive video service, which is on a secondary audio program, that SAP button on your television, that's either Spanish, or if you rotate through it, you may find descriptive video service, where when I stop talking and do this, another voice comes on and says, he moves thoughtfully across the room. <laughs> so it describes what just happened in a, in a void between two lines of the script. You know what the trouble is with that? This is my ax. trouble with that is all programs do not have that. Right. And there's nowhere that you can find out which program has it and which program. It's, it's, it's a fishing expedition. You have to turn on that SAP thing and then wait for the Because otherwise you get Spanish when you don't want it. Well, no. <laughs> you, you can go to the audio description yes. choice. But then what happens is you wait for the program to come on and wait to see if, like you just walked across, if they don't describe that, right. okay, it's not audio described. So now you've got to turn that back off again because sometimes you will lose other programs' voice. Right. <laughs> so yes. oh. so uh, it, it becomes... Used to, I just asked about this this morning in preparation for this talk because, as you heard before, um, in that wonderful introduction, I couldn't have done a better job myself like if I wrote it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Lord. Um but, but um, it used to be the program guide. It would say DDS in parentheses years ago. So I just checked this morning because I, I just came back to WCNY and I needed to update myself on some of this technology. So I asked, and DDS is alive and well, anything that comes out of GBH in Boston, including Masterpiece Theater and other programs, all of those programs have DDS, but it's not in our program guide. No. I just learned that this morning. It's no, stopped it's, years ago. It's not on the guide on the, the TV. The TV might say uh, SAP. Yeah. But if it's but like you don't SAP, know what that means. SAP is usually the Spanish, it's yes. not the secondary. Uh, so what you need to do is figure out which programs you like that have it. And as I said before, Masterpiece Theater, yep. Mystery Masterpiece, it's going to be on all of those. Yep. And you find the programs that work for you. And, and, and you know, make sure you leave your name with me because if I can dig up anything on DVS, yeah. so what programs. <coughs> I've been all the way down the road with WCNY and uh, Time Warner about this. And okay. I'm at the end of it. How so? 
it's frustrating. You can't. Uh, I, I mean, when when you look at a guide like on the Time Warner guide, right. it'll say uh, CC for closed captioning. Right. It'll say HD for uh, <coughs> HD. Right. It'll say um, it's got the earphones for surround sound. Mm -hmm. It might have SAP, but it's not audio SAP. It's <coughs> But if you had a list of programs that always had DVS, that wouldn't be a value? Uh, it would be a value, but where do you have it? Um, I'm suggesting it? I might look for it for okay. it. Okay, thank you. If you'd like me to. Okay. If you don't want me to, I would like to. To address that point, I saw some movies, some digital movies, that have that underlying copy. Mm -hmm. And it says he walks through the room, mm -hmm. he walks across the room thoughtfully. Mm -hmm. In fact, don't tell anybody, but I saw a movie over at the other library. <laughs> Regal movies have it for every single movie. Yes. My, my point, folks, in talking about readout and DVS and closed captioning is that those are all, well, readout, readout is a little different, but closed captioning and DVS are both services that began on public broadcasting. Because if there's not a commercial reason to do something like that, you find that in many cases, could you put the name and number on there and I'll see what I can dig up for you? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, um, those are services that just wouldn't originate and flourish in the, in the commercial world, but they do on public broadcasting. I have a somewhat of a personal commitment. However, so there is on Monday night uh, a whole hour from 9 to 10 o'clock where they do it. Who's the that channel. you're referring to? Uh, uh, NBC Channel 3. They use descriptive video service? Yes. For a specific program? Mm -hmm. Two programs. That's great. Well, that, that, but that leads me to the whole discussion of children's programming, how to programming, <coughs> cooking programming, those all began on public television. And as the media changes and as there are more out outlets, programs become commercially viable that were not when they began. So the question is, what new program genre or service might be necessary or needed or helpful in a year or three or five that will only find a home on public broadcasting to begin? <coughs>